to move on. So um, the next presentation will actually be um, about an element of, of your, uh, your framework as well, Frank, embedding and basically about embedding practicing uh, inclusive education in the level of the classroom. So there is a wonderful uh, case actually by um, Dr. Saran Stewart and Dr. Nikisha Stevenson, both from the University of the West Indies. Um, Saran and Nikisha, can I maybe ask you to briefly introduce yourselves? Um, also say something about your context um, of Jamaica at the University of the West Indies and also your, your roles within that institution. So I give so it to, to you. Sure. Thanks, Josephine. Um, if you guys hear any noise because I have a fan on, let, let me know and I can just turn it off for a little bit and then turn it back on when I go back on mute. All right. Good evening, everyone. And good afternoon if you are somewhat on this side of the world. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Saren Stewart. I am a senior lecturer um, of comparative higher education. I studied with Professor Frank Hewitt at the University of Denver. I am also uh, Hi, I'm Dr. Nikisha Stevenson. I'm a lecturer at University of West Indies, um, Mona, and I'm in the chemistry department. So all of this stuff was very new to me because I'm a trained organic chemist. And then when you're like, huh, there's, I can't connect with my students. What do I do? I reached out to Saran, we started talking, and that was basically how this whole project was born. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and share our slides. Um, how we will do it is that I will take probably the first two slides and then Dr. Stevenson will actually take on the balance of it as I have another presentation. Is everyone seeing our slides? If you could just shake your heads, that would be great. Awesome. Um, we do have a question for everyone and what I would encourage at the end is that we actually enter our responses through the chat room if we can because it would be great to get some feedback and dialogue going once time permits. I do have the closeout case, so I'll see you again throughout that if you wanted to ask questions. So let's start. Dr. Stevenson and I were happily funded for this project through um, the Office of Research at, in our, at our principal's office at the campus level. The University of the West Indies, as Josephine had asked us, but I completely forgot, is actually most comparable to the European and British context in particular. As a former British colony and a former British University College of um, University of London, the University of the West Indies was formed and essentially independent once we received independence in 1962 as well. However, to date, we still have most of our policies, regulations, practices that simulate our former university um, college identity, even though we're a full-fledged University of the West Indies. We have multiple campuses across the Caribbean. The Mona campus in which Dr. Stevenson and, Stevenson and I are located is the largest campus, which is the largest population of students, closely to about 18,000 students. But we also have campuses across Trinidad and Tobago, which is the St. Augustine campus, as well as Barbados, which is the Cave Hill campus. And we have a virtual campus, which is the Open campus. Saying all of that, we're one of two types of regional institutions like this across the world, University of South Fiji being the other. There's relevance because in implementing anything um, with regards to change takes buy-in from all the campuses, right? So bringing us into harvesting the sun's energy, measuring undergraduate student science, confidence, motivation, knowledge gains. The reason why we started this was that the then deputy principal um, that's Professor Kawa, had approached me about there being a need in Dr. Stevenson's faculty and his then um, faculty, which is the Faculty of Science and Technology. They had been seeing large numbers of failing rates, especially in his discipline, which is chemistry, but across the faculty, including um, the discipline of mathematics or the Department of Mathematics, Department of Physics, and they're having larger um, failure rates. And so he approached me about what could be some of the challenges and what could be some of the recommendations and solutions. 
Born out of that, Dr. Stevenson also saw the very need at the classroom level happening within her classes. And she had large classrooms of up to anywhere from the preliminary classes being about 200 students to um, the first year chemist, chemistry students. And that was anywhere up to 650 students. And um, the outcomes were kind of proportionate when it came to failure rates. And so we started to look at the curriculum, we started to look at the lab, we started to look at the summative assessment that was highly weighted on examinations, and then started to formulate what is the problem happening right here? Not just the failure rates, but where was it stemming from? So we started to look at solutions about pedagogy and curriculum. I won't spend a lot of time on this because I will actually touch back on it in my case. So I'll give you the definition and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stevenson. Essentially what you see before you is a derivative of Professor Tewitt's original um, concept of inclusive pedagogy that he had written about at, during his time at Harvard. And what I since then was look at how to essentially have it formulate critical consciousness within students, but that can only happen as a critical consciousness within faculty as well. And so the definition that we have is critical inclusive pedagogy describes a pedagogy of possibility that enables the creation of transformative, equitable, and identity affirming learning environments where all students have the chance to learn at the highest levels. And diversity in all its components is central to the learning process and not excluded from. So with that said, I'm gonna take it over to Dr. Stevenson to carry you through the rest of the slides. Hi. So picking up from what um, Saran said, so when we started talking, we started to, okay, all the students need some form of an intervention, what would be the best place for this intervention to be placed? Our class sizes are pretty large, and we're from a stand, um, 200 to 600, depending on the class. But it was in the lab where we actually had the most time to the students, so four hours. Um, we had them for four hours once a week, and there were smaller sizes, about 50 students within the lab. Um, traditionally, chemistry labs are designed so that students have a hands-on approach to start learning necessary skills for them to actually become part of the discipline. What we started to realize is that our kids weren't learning, or students weren't learning um, in the lab or doing what we expected the lab to do. First off, we had very outdated experiments. So if you look back 20, 30 years, the same labs we're doing today are the same labs we were doing decades ago. Um, Students come in, they know what the result, expected results are. Instructors, we know what the expected results are. Therefore, there was nothing there for them to actually critically think about. It was just showing up, get your results, leave, get your grade, and you're good to go. And this type of learning did not promote any form of creative thinking or problem solving skills, which the labs are originally designed to promote. And this led to students just not being interested. So they, so they weren't interested in the labs, and there was no connection between the lab and the lectures, which is supposed to be something from, um, the labs are supposed to do. So we started looking around and saying, how could we fix this? And we looked at a research-based lab. So unlike a lot of other big uh, countries like the US or Europe, we don't, Jamaica does not have a huge science and technology, technology infrastructure, right? Um, and so asking your students now to like imagine what it would be like to work at some big um, pharma company or some big tech company, they didn't have that within their own context. And so the disconnect between the chemistry they were doing and the kind of profession that they saw themselves working at. Most of our students wanted to go to med school or law school or was just like, I don't know how this actually connects to the bigger picture. So we started to say, okay, how about if they got involved in research from very early? So we started looking like, instead of doing these recipe-based labs where everything is already known, how about given just putting them in the deep end? Let's do an experiment-based lab where they know participating research as um, labs are based on the research of our faculty members. So we looked at one lab, the Harpoon lab, which I will talk, which I'll touch on. And the one of the benefits of this is that the results are open-ended. So it's about the process and not the end result. And so students don't know where it's going to lead. And furthermore, the instructors know where it's going to lead. Now you have to work together in unison and actually can get the data required. It also teaches them new skills because they have to work on new instruments and techniques that's not part of the traditional lab. And these type of labs have been shown to motivate students um, in, other, um, in other universities. Wonderful. So, 
Oh, sorry, Seren? Yeah. So, so what we looked at was that one of the big problems we have in Jamaica is in electricity and energy. So it's, we have, a, in the context, we have a thing called Vision 2030, and it's supposed to be the Jamaican transi transitioning from a petroleum-based industry to a more renewable-based industry. And every one of our students can recognize the fact that electricity is high, the prices are high, and it's really hard to afford to start a business or do anything um, um, where electricity is concerned. So when we start the lab, we introduce the students to this bigger context, like here is a big problem. If Jamaica is going to grow economically, if we're going to advance ourselves as a country, we're going to have to solve this energy crisis. And not, we can't just sit and wait for another country to solve it for us. We also have to be part of that solution. And so they're given the, whole, the data showing that 95% of our energy comes from petroleum, only a very small fraction, 5%, come from renewable energy. And they're also showing that it costs us around 42 cents per kilowatt hour, which is a lot more expensive than other um, nations. And furthermore, because oil is bought in US dollars, as these prices fluctuate, then we don't have a say, it's going to cost us more. So therefore, or the amount of money we spend in oil can vary just based off the exchange rate. So they're introduced to the problem. And then they're also told that here is another way for us to view um, that we can view our economy to move away from a petroleum-based economy now to uh, one that's based off solar fuel that's renewable. So they're now introduced to um, a dream economy, so a solar-based economy, where all of our energy now is gained from solar energy, from sunlight. And they've, some of them have heard about the hydrogen economy, some of them have heard about um, climate change and global warming. And then what we said, what the real problem is. The real problem is that we really want to build this type of society, we want to have this solar based economy, but as scientists, we haven't figured everything out yet. And that's where they come in. There's this one problematic step involving water splitting, taking water and splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen that we don't know how to do. And, they're, and by participating in the lab, they can help us to solve this one pivotal step and not only just carry a lab exercise, Will actually become a part of science to the community because now their result is going to help to add to the bigger, adding to the bigger picture. Um, the lab itself is carried out over two days. It's pretty simple. Um, it was developed from um, Jenny Shuttlefield and Shannon Stahl. Um, it's called a Harpoon Lab, which is, stands for Heterogeneous and Anodes, rapidly produced for oxygen over potential neutralization. And what this actually this big acronym stands for is. We're going to take a bunch of metal salts, mix them in water, <laughs> known concentration. We're going to make an electrode, heat them up, and then we're going to test for their ability to take water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen. And so first day, the students are introduced to the problem. They make their solutions. They make their electrodes. And then the second lab, the second week, they'll come in and they'll actually set up their own little electri um, electrochemistry kit and they'll look for metal oxides that will produce oxygen. So what they're looking for is very bright green dots. Right, so this type of lab is nothing that they would have done before. Everything is new to them, it's new to us, and it's new to our demonstrators. And it's just like, okay, let's just figure this out together. And so, and the whole idea is that we're searching for a solution to, to find a cheaper source of electricity. So that's the lab in a nutshell, and it was a huge learning experience. Again, I'm not an edu I'm not an educator. I just got a degree in chemistry. They put me in front of a lab, a, a class, and say, hey, go teach. And then when you start teaching and realize it's not working, and then you realize it's not just, it wasn't just me, it was everybody else in my faculty, it's just not working for us and what we're going to do. So bringing the Harpoon Lab on, we, we got buy-in from the students. But we realized that resources, in, trans, in taking this lab from, that was developed in the United States and bringing it to Jamaica, we have to now change the lab up so that we can actually make it accessible in terms of the money that um, we're spending for the lab. We had to rewrite the lab manual and present the data in a way that was new and fresh and hip. So there was color, um, it was in different binders, there were links, there it was, it was, the lab was presented in the context of what the greater problem was. And we also had to retrain all of our demonstrators, demonstrators and support staff. Because for years they've been used to coming in, it's the same lab, everyone knows what's happening, and now they're in a position where we don't know what the results are going to be. The students are going to freak out because they don't know what the results are going to be. And how do we all work together to get on to get to the um, to get to the desired outcomes? Um, the data from um, 
and Sarah can talk more on this if she'd like, but from the data, we saw that there was an increase in science, motivation, and knowledge gain. Um, there was some increase in, there was some decrease in student confidence, and I think this is because our students were, for the first time, they actually have to be thinking on their feet, and it wasn't a comfortable lab to do because now they have to, it wasn't, they didn't know what the answer was. And they're not, they don't like not knowing what the answer is, right? We also, I also have students who went on notice, who seemed disinterested. They came alive during the lab. They wanted to know, ooh, can I come in, can I try this again? Can we do, can I try this compound? Can I add iodide? Therefore, it was a very eye-opening for me. And as an instructor, I gained insights into how my students were thinking. Um, I had more meaningful interactions with them because now I wasn't judging them based off some pre, I expect you to get this. If you don't get it, obviously you didn't do any work. But I had to ask them, okay, why did you do this? What's your next step? How were you thinking about this? So I had more meaningful inter interaction with my students. And it was also uncomfortable for me too because I want to make sure that they're okay and that they know the answer and that introducing something new is not robbing them of a quality education. So it was uncomfortable for both sets of people across, but in the end, it was a positive experience. So potential outcomes. So after running this lab and um, showing on multiple times that it can actually work in our context, we were able to now look at changes to the curriculum. So we're undergoing a massive overhaul of our first year chemistry program in both the lab and the lectures. And the Harpoon Lab and everything else will be a part of it. Um, and more of these types of hands-on research-based experiments. Um, it would now facilitate that we change the weighting of our lab and also to look at the way in which the, ped the pedagogy that we need in teaching. So we're gonna work very closely with the Education um, School of Ed and Chemistry Department to make sure if we're implementing something that's actually doing what we want. And furthermore, one of the biggest take home lessons was with my colleagues and realizing that the way in which we approach teaching was not from a sense of facilitators, but as gatekeepers, where I've had colleagues who like the cream will rise to the top. So it's not our job to, uh, it's our job to make sure that only the, the ones that look like us, talk like us, and can actually um, present well are the ones that get, get through when everybody else gets screened out which is problematic because our student population is changing, where a majority of the students we're seeing, their first, gener their first time generation is coming to colleges, and so we have to change the way in which we interact with them if we want to see a positive outcome. Dan? So um, basically, we, um, that Stevenson really said it well and all throughout, this has been a two-year project and funded project. We do want to continue, but the one of the biggest outcomes for us is now change in the curriculum. In the past, the curriculum was 70% exam and 30% coursework, in, a, in which about, I believe, 15% um, was devoted to the lab, but they spend 70% of their time in the labs. And somehow the connection between the repetitiveness of the status, status quo labs were not connecting to how they were performing in the exams. And so the focus is now on changing the curriculum and um, essentially retooling um, the faculty in terms of this new change curriculum or what is anticipated to be the new change curriculum. So one of the questions, if we have time permits and Josephine, you can let, let us know, is what can um, European faculty members do to create more inclusive learning environments in their own STEM classrooms? What have you been doing? Um, we have found that this has worked for us and we're going to try to enhance it as we've gone through the past two years on it. I see that the chat box has lit up, so I don't know if there's questions for us, but um, Josephine, should I take questions? Um, how do you want us to do this? Yeah, okay. yeah thank you. Um, I think there are two questions that um, are actually three questions by two people uh, that came out of your uh, presentation. Um, and Dan, Dan Romain is actually a participant in the webinar and he uh, poses the question, these su suggestions are very nice, but are more related to principles of active teaching and learning. What is the specific change that's made regarding diversity and inclusion? Right. Um, perhaps uh, Saran um, and Nikisha, do you have an answer to that question? Sure. So with regards to diversity and inclusion, I think um, Nikisha was adding it, but probably at the end of it, 
our population of students has drastically changed from when we knew it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you were dealing with um, more a homogenous group of students that were coming in from the highest performing sets of um, the highest performing sets of secondary schools into tertiary education. They were coming in with higher pass rates and you are looking at a higher standard of class of students coming in as well. And you were looking at um, less and less first generation students. Today, we're dealing with more first generation students, more girls, by the way, sorry, the gender binary that we have looked at within our university is actually 70% female to 30% male, which is somewhat unheard of in most of the globe. Um, we are unique in our context across the Caribbean or one of the unique um, regions where our gender parity is far from equal or equitable when it comes to the male female um, gender however within the faculty level it is predominated by men and especially at the senior level at the lower level which is the lecturer pool and the assistant lecturer pool you'll find that there are more women that outnumber but when it comes to the senior lecturer pool and the professor pool most of our students are taught by the male um, by male faculty at that level so with regards to diversity and inclusion we were looking at the changing demographics of our students, which was to include um, class shifts in particular and first generation students from non-traditional backgrounds in particular, and as well as non-traditional students, and how to tailor then our curriculum and our pedagogy to suit this new generation, or had not so much new, but we're finally seeing it as something that needs to be looked at in terms of how we shape our curriculum and pedagogy to suit our students and not asking them to necessarily suit us because they're coming in droves so how are we going to meet their demands so that was where when it comes to ethnicity or changes um similar to some of my european colleagues context or or predominant context are jamaicans in terms of who we serve and in the project we found that probably about 85 percent of our student population are jamaicans and then a growing 15 percent of our students are from different countries across the world but in particular concentrated in the caribbean uh, i don't know if nikki do you want to add anything to that part no that yeah you, you hit the nail on the head i think um when we talk about diversity, it's very easy to see diversity in when there is um, an other, whether it's two different so people from different countries or if you have in terms of um, racial, diverse, racial diversity. In our context, diversity cuts really nicely along um, our class lines where there is a, diff a distinct barrier between students who are coming from certain neighborhoods or certain class society compared to the lecturers who are coming mostly from middle and upper class portions of society and does cause a rift of where we don't understand each other, we don't speak the same languages and other problems. Um, with regards to Walter's question below, he asks, how did you relate the, to the specific and personal context of the students and how did you use the framework, IP framework in regards to the labs? Um, with regards to the personal context of the students in particular, a lot of the students, so some of you may not know, but it was a primary example. Um, we've been having light cuts, electricity cuts, right? <laughs> We're trying to actually deal with energy. So um, I had to scramble last minute to kind of find a Wi-Fi hot zone in order to make this webinar. With our very unreal or somewhat unreliable electricity demands within the country we've had um one of the concerted efforts that we were looking at in trying to find a lab appropriate that ev all the students could relate to regardless was energy and how we were looking for alternative um modes of energy in that terms of context when it comes to the student and so the students were able to see how it would directly relate to their living conditions, to their life context, when it comes to always having to figure out high energy costs or going without electricity or having to pay these extreme um, costs on their end. Nikki, do you want to comment on the first question? Because I'm gonna change the slides to go back to the framework. Oh, and to add to you in terms of context is that some of these students are 
in neighborhoods where they don't even have electricity because they can't afford it because it's really high. And so there are some levels of either borrowing electricity from the grid um, and or using alternative measures such as um, oil-based lamps, which, can, which is dangerous because it's known to cause fires and deaths um, in these different communities. So this is something that was very much a part of their life that they thought about. Yeah, and so the hope is that if they saw the need, and we will talk about this now with the pedagogical framework, if they saw the immediate need and how they were contributing to solving this need, that they right. would have more buy-in for this lab because it affected them directly, not just as a populace of a people in the country, but how it affected them at home as well. Um, with regards to Walter's last um, question and how the concepts fit back with the model, the, um, what Nikki didn't talk about because we didn't have time, but it is, I believe it is in the case we did spend a lot of time with the students in terms of having this dialogical discourse with them and gaining buy-in from them about why this lab matters. A lot of times because they had previous labs that they could easily, you know, go to a former student on and look at the old lab manuals, they were disinterested and or had already lost um, interest in the labs and in the course because they thought, one, it doesn't matter if I do the labs or, you know, figure it out. And two, my thoughts don't matter, but I just need to write down an answer. Because of the high probability of any three of those compounds being mixed at any varying levels could lead towards us solving this, you know, making a proper solution. There wasn't a one size fits all and there was not one perfect answer. The students finally realizing that throughout the process were being engaged constantly about, well, you tell us what you found. So sharing that power within the classroom and lab context with letting them know that we don't have all the answers for this. You will probably have the answers because within your small teams, you have come up with the proper compound or the right ratios that we did not come up with or this global um, project of Harpoon has not come up with. So there was a uh, sharing power within that and there was um, definitely students being able to activate their voices as they started to command the labs towards finding um, what was lighting up pink and yellow, right, Nix? Green, green. <laughs> green. I was like, green. <laughs> I was green. Like, green. There Absolutely. you go, You're right. And there was more faculty-student interaction throughout the process than there had been um, before in other labs and in the control group labs. So we also had a control and a treatment group to see how um, these various principles would be looked and tweaked at. So we have a timekeeper who has let us know that the time we need to move on to the next webinar. Um, so Josephine, you want to take over here? <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to thank you so much. Um, since we have um, also another case to discuss, um, I really want to thank you for you know enlighten, enlightening us with um, with information about basically how to um, how the harvesting the sun's energy case is essentially a research project um, that focuses on curriculum development also by training staff but so to some extent the cases of OD faculty fellows and um, and, and your um, your case of sun harvesting the sun's energy uh, is, is um, quite quite similar to some extent um, and comparable I want to thank you so much for uh, for joining um, and explaining a little bit more about this case. Mm -hmm.